Let's go back to the original metaphor of seven or eight or ten jigsaw puzzles all mixed up. Every single piece must be in place. Or let's just say just one jigsaw puzzle. You ever do a jigsaw puzzle and you're missing ten pieces? You know, your dog ate them or something like that and um, you know, it's not a complete picture. Or you try to shove a piece that doesn't fit into a hole that's not the proper receptacle. The issue about hidden in plain sight and all of these fragments that individually make no sense is that unless you have the complete picture and how it all dovetails, interrelates, and is a complete picture, you don't have the whole thing. And the system is designed and the parties, the public actors, the judges and so forth are trained to see where there's a flaw. And that flaw gives them a jurisdictional attachment. Okay, it's called traversal. Traversal is, you know, you're from Canada, I'm sure you must have gone skiing, and if you're on the mountain, you traverse from one side to the other, right? Well, in law, you can be in one jurisdiction, and just one little thing, one little acquiescence to an offer to contract by the judge traverses you back to the other side, to his jurisdiction where he controls it. The problem with Dean and he's, he's, he's a great guy, I've never met him or talked to him, but I've seen his work. It's, it's very advanced, but he's missing pieces. And if you're missing all, some of the pieces, you don't have the whole picture, you are jurisdictionally attached to their jurisdiction where they can legally and technically pull you in, put you in jail, and all of that. So now you've just opened that up for me to tell you and, and describe the most important piece that everybody misses, okay? The, um, I've mentioned the year 1863. I've mentioned martial law, things like that. We are in martial law in the United States and through the United States Corporation through the rest of the world. That martial law was implemented in the beginning of the Civil War. Then in 1863, Lincoln, um, uh, it's not right, we're chartered, contracted, uh, commission, that's the word. He commissioned one of his field officers to create a body of rules for military occupation of occupied enemy territory. That was called, his name was Franz Lieber, and that was called the Lieber Code. And that Lieber Code describes what a foreign military occupier must do under the rules of the United States to maintain proper military relationship to the civil body and the people of that conquered territory. Okay, So that was issued in 1863. And the war ended, Lincoln was shot, um, the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868, and in 1867, something called the Reconstruction Acts were issued. Those created five military districts for the 10 Confederate states. Those states wanted to come back into the original organic constitutional union, which had been dissolved. Okay, the way it was dissolved is because Congress um, adjourned when the states walked out, the southern states. So Lincoln was killed because he destroyed the Union, but he wanted to put it back together. And of course, the Rothschilds who were in control were not going to let that happen. So he was taken out, and the Reconstruction Acts established military districts for the 10 southern states. Those southern states never left the military districts, so they have always been under military occupation. Then when um, the 1933 bankruptcy was initiated and the um, Emergency Banking Relief Act was passed, that shifted the whole system into emergency war powers, mil full military occupation. That's why the Fed Federal Reserve System has 10 districts. That's why the world is broken up in districts. They are all military districts. So we have to understand military occupation. Then from the Civil War period, you have two very important things that took place. 
1899, there was a Hague Convention and a treaty issued. And it's, it's, that treaty defined the nature of war on land. And war on land has to do with when there's a war on land, because everything I've described is the law of the sea. So they have to bring the law of the sea onto the land, and they created a treaty that everybody agreed to, or signatories agreed to that. And the first part of that treaty defined the nature of a belligerent. And it defines a belligerent who is a people who take up arms against an invading force. Okay? That's why you hear, you know, Iraqis or Syrians or Libyans who take up arms as belligerents. It's under this treaty. Okay? Next, in 1907, you have another treaty issued that adopted the rules of the Liber Code, and it made it global or international law to which the United States is bound. And then in that uh, 1907 um, treaty, it states at Article 55 that the military occupier is bound by rules of usufruct. Have you ever heard that word? No. Okay. Usufruct is derived, uh, derived from two Latin words. Usus, which means to use, and fruct or fructos, which means the fruit. What that means is a usufruct is allowed to use the fruit of another's tree. Let me define that in military occupation terms. It means the military occupier is authorized under these international treaties to use the fruit of the occupied people, property, and territories under duties and rules of usufruct. So that means the United States as a foreign body, the, the corporation in Washington, D.C., became the military occupier, and by 1907 was under the rules of this international treaty structure that gave it full permission, full authority, to use the fruit of the occupied people, property, and territories for military necessity. Okay, so then in, um, well, before I go into that, the other part of the article that I quoted says that if everything is under civil, uh, civil uh, um, the civil body is maintaining its peaceful relationship with the military occupier, meaning it's not a belligerent. It's not taking up arms against that military occupation. If it does, then the military occupier is bound by the duties of usufruct, and there are five of those. The first one is it must issue a receipt for everything taken from the occupied territory and people. The birth certificate is that receipt. So it takes all the people and property, puts it under each one of our birth certificates. That's the receipt. Secondly, it must issue inventory or take a proper inventory of all the property taken. That inventory is done by the bureaucratic administrative bodies that we know as governments. So now they've taken it under military necessity. They've issued us a receipt. They've given us an inventory which we can access in the system. So now they have the right of usufruct to use the fruit of our labor in order to maintain and uh, continue their military necessity. Thirdly, they must maintain the property in good condition. They must, uh, fourthly, they must pay all fees, taxes, maintenance, repairs, everything to maintain that property. And fifthly, they must return the property to the original owners in proper or improved condition upon the cessation of the military occupation. So what does that translate to? The United States became the military occupier first of the 10 southern states through five military districts by the Reconstruction Acts. It then created a whole body of military function and occupation. The Federal Reserve Act is part of that. So the Federal Reserve note is nothing more than a mil private military script that we're given permission to use under military occupation. They're supposed to maintain everything, but here's the twist. 
They put us put the corporation into bankruptcy. They issued the Emergency Banking Relief Act, declared it a martial law occupation in effect. And from that point forward, any act that was done in the public, which means in commerce, under the rules of the Uniform Commercial Code, which control all securities, all monetary structure, all taxation, things like that, that Anything done in the public in commerce is against the law, is illegal, and must be licensed. So that's why we have to get a license to operate in commerce. We have to get a business license, a doctor's license, a contractor's license. All of these are permissions to do something that is technically illegal. If you were to go to a law dictionary, look under the word license, it says permission to do something that's illegal. Okay? So then we get a driver's license. And that gives us the ability to be a driver in commerce to operate our commercial franchise. Okay, you getting that picture? But if we do anything against their military occupation, then we're considered an enemy of the state. We're considered a belligerent. That's why under the Patriot Act, now we have something called paper terrorism or domestic terrorism. Because the whole public federal military occupation is called the domestic zone. And so if we do something against their military rules, which is the 60 to 80 million codes and statutes in the United States and millions in Canada and Mexico and everywhere else, then we are doing something that's technically causing harm to the public. We are considered a domestic terrorist. We are a belligerent and we are an enemy combatant, okay? This is why every being, every man like Dean Clifford and all the rest of them who I've studied with have ended up in jail because they are still operating under the bonded surety franchise relationship that means that they must comply to all the rules of the military occupation. So commerce is a battlefield. We have to remove ourselves from commerce. That doesn't mean remove ourselves from, from business or enterprise or um, you know, capitalism. It just means we have to stop operating in their playing field because their playing field is a battlefield. And one more point and then I'm going to turn it back to you. Go back to the 14th Amendment. In the 14th Amendment, it says that the, the public debt cannot be challenged. Well, wait, first of all, in, in Section 1, it says all persons born or naturalized within the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. That's what defines a U.S. person. Then in section four, it says all the entire national de public debt cannot be challenged as to its validity. It means that the, as long as you're operating as a public person, a U.S. person, and remember, every nation on the planet is a U.S. person, okay? It is subject to U.S. law, and therefore every citizen in every nation is a U.S. person. They're just not acting on it yet. So if we're subject to their jurisdiction as the bonded surety through the bankrupt franchise, we cannot challenge the debt. We are bonded to it and we cannot challenge it. Secondly, that inviolable nature of that debt obligation extends to, and you can just go, just Google 14th Amendment and read it. You will see it right there. It says, including the obligations for pensions, and bounty for services in the suppression of insurrection and rebellion. This is the key. See, I've seen that phrasing for 25 years. I read it and read it and I kept asking myself, why is that there? You know, it doesn't make sense until I understood the military occupation and everything else that we've talked about. It means that if you're still the bonded surety, and you do something against their millions of codes and statutes, you are considered a belligerent because you're a paper terrorist under the Patriot Act, and you are causing domestic terrorism and harm to the public. As such, you can be suppressed. That suppression can come in the form of a court case, a criminal charge, 
um, a tax bill, everything you see happening in the United States and in the world is all based on this one construct, military occupation and a belligerent relationship to the military occupier. So the secret of being a true anarchist and anar anarcho-capitalist, if I could pronounce it right, is to disconnect our bondage to this whole system and move ourselves into the private under the, everything that we teach in Gemstone and Pantera Society and all the rest of it and become a true living man on the land, which we have the capacity to do.